Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's go ahead and center. And know that truth is within us. Truth is our inheritance from spirit. Truth in the form of wonderful, beautiful thoughts and ideas, divine ideas, is the priceless gift that we are given each moment. And either we open to that flow of divinity, that flow of truth, and we relax into it, we rest into it, or we constrict and squeeze and push and pull and distort. And the choice is eternal and it's now. And it only takes one quick moment to open and to relax. And that is our opportunity this evening. It's a wonderful thing to be able to relax and to allow truth to flow into our hearts, into our minds. To let go of grudges and bitter memories. It's so simple. So simple. And the only challenge is overcoming a fear of what is no longer there, which is in the past. We are overcomers. We are victors. We are the chosen expressions of God in this now moment. We are Christ bearers to each other. May it be that we go to sleep tonight relaxed and in the full knowledge that God speaks to us each moment. We only need to listen. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, said Jesus. The gospel is easy. The gospel is light. May this be in our hearts, in the depths of our soul. May we have fun. So be it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have tonight um, three things to do. First of all, we've, we've got uh, the, the business of this class, which I've avoided for four weeks. <laughs> so um, uh, we're going to do a, an in-class um, uh, exercise and write a piece um, in there, and that will be your, your final paper. And for those of you who want to take it home, that's fine. But, um, It'll be meditative, it'll be a, a, a process, it won't just be quietness, it'll be a process where we'll be able to work through some of the material that we've had. And, and that will be your, your, uh, your uh, assignment for the class. And uh, so that's it, we got that business. Secondly, I want to talk about the, uh, the letters and the Gospel of John and the Revelation of Actually, that's what we're talking. That's really the whole thing. Revelation of John is a big piece of that. But we've talked about Peter and the very early part of Christianity after uh, um, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. We talked about Paul 
not only the authentic Paul, but the inauthentic Paul, the Paul before the destruction of Jerusalem and the Paul that was had letters attributed to him after the de destruction of Jerusalem. And that's roughly a 40, 50 year period. Now we're moving roughly from the years 80 to 90, all the way to the years 125 uh, AD. And that's what I call the, pe the period of John. Um, and there really is a, dis uh, a noticeable difference in the focus of the writings and the that we see in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, as most of you know, is very different from the other Gospels. The letters of John are very different. There's, that is where we see these repeated passages about God is love. Okay? And then we have the Revelation of John, which is in a category by itself. And I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about that. Um, so we got the the the. the, the um, piece that we're going to write, we'll do that after the letters of John. Um, let, let's do all John, then do probably spend the last 45 minutes on, on the writing. Um, and we'll take a break in there. Okay. Um, if you have, uh, we'll get into this. Tonight, um, there is a concept. It's an old-fashioned Christian concept called overcoming. And if you go back to the uh, earlier Unity writings, you're going to see a ton of references to being an overcomer. And there's actually, if you go to the course, it's not in the book. Um, uh, Unity had what was called a correspondence school course from 1912 until 1973. That was their equivalent of SEE. The Correspondence School course was, was the education for lay people. And you had to take the Correspondence School course in order to um, in order to be a minister prior to 1930. That was the ministerial training. Uh, but all the way up till 1973, that was the, that's what Lay people did, and if they wanted to study unity teachings, they took this correspondence school course. And there's there's a beginner's course, an advanced course. The beginner's course has six lessons, and lesson five is called overcoming. And um, I, I, I want to make sure everyone understands how important this concept of overcoming is in unity's history because we're going to do metaphysical Bible interpretation, we have to understand that the, Charles Fillmore thought he was going to regenerate his body. The Fillmore's placed a very, very high standard of spiritual development. This was not for spiritual tire kickers. This was not a religion for spiritual seekers. And I don't disparage people who are just spiritual seekers. I'm just simply saying the Fillmore's had no patience. They didn't give any time to spiritual seekers. And they thought that the spiritual seekers were out there in new thought um, and they wanted they what they called the Jesus Christ standard. They were much more strict. And they expected that uh, unity, those who applied unity teachings would go through a spiritual unfoldment. That there would actually be a transformation. A, um, a born again experience, a, um, a, a, a an expression of the Holy Spirit. They they used a lot of biblical terms for that, but they were dead serious about what they called overcoming. And what I wanted to touch on, I know you may not be able to see this, but if you go to the correspondence school course, and you go to lesson five on overcoming, there's some questions that are answered asked. And the first one is, why do you want to overcome? And they talk about dominion. Um, why do we want to exercise dominion? In traditional Christianity, we're weak. Um, Jesus loves me. I am weak, but he is strong. Right? That's the fundamental story of Christianity. In unity, we are strong. We are empowered. We have dominion. That's what the, the power of our voice. Um, and we have dominion because it's implanted in us to have dominion. And dominion, 
is dominion over our thinking. Okay? And they expected that we would evolve to a point where negativity didn't exist in our consciousness. That we would break through to this uh, positive state of seeing only the good. Okay? Why, then why does evil appear in the world is the second question. And the answer is because we have uh, acquired a, a habitual way of thinking that where God is not in charge. It's a dualistic thinking where there's an evil out there, there's, a, you know, the world is out to get me, um, my spouse doesn't love me, my, um, you know, I'm, uh, I, I was born with bad genes or whatever, and we have allowed that type of thinking to occur. And what they're talking about doing is eliminating that negativity in our consciousness. And where that, that negativity resides is in the subconscious phase of mind. Now, subconscious phase of mind is exactly what we, how we would use that term today. It's our unconsciousness. It's that part of our uh, mental apparatus that we are not aware of. The belief is, though, that we inherited negativity not from God, but from what they call race consciousness. Mm -hmm. And race consciousness has nothing to do, it has to do with the human race. And the goal here is to overcome um, the function, the, 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 the pollution that has come to the subconscious mind and to enter into a new state, a new man, which is called the Christ consciousness. Okay? And overcoming, rightly, overcoming is seen as an inner realization of victory over error states of consciousness. Period. What is, what is man to overcome? You are to overcome the negative effects. Um, the negative belief that you are a great sinner and that you are not loved by God. Okay, And that is what's known as working out your own salvation. Okay. Now, I'm going to leave it at that. I just wanted to bring this up because all of the writings tonight in John fundamentally are dealing with overcoming. And they're overcoming a number of things. In historical factors, they're overcoming uh, persecution because they have broken from Judaism. They are no longer Jews. They are now uh, this renegade sect on their own in a Greek world and they're getting persecuted. Um, they're getting persecuted by the Jews. And they no longer have the temple and the temple rites and Judaism to hold their faith together. And Jesus hasn't come back. It's now been, they're on the second and the third generation. And this is now a solid 60 years after Jesus is gone, maybe 70 years, and he hasn't shown up or not as, as they have ex expected. And so they're really struggling. And the whole lesson of what's going to go on in these, in these letters and in the Revelation of John and also in the Gospel of John is stay the course, overcome the race consciousness that, um, that you get from Greek thought and that you get from Jewish, uh, Jewish thought and hold to this idea of one power and one presence. And that theme is very, very strong there. Okay? So that's just the, the backdrop of what I want you to see. Now if you would, go through, go to page 51. Some, these are some things I'd probably take back if I were rewriting this right now. But um, what's false teaching today? What is your? I mean, is anybody out there promoting false teaching today? 
Does it? Does false teaching exist? I think not on her business. Just what they know at that time. So like science is, you know, evolved. And, okay. You know, the world was flat. That's all they knew. Mm -hmm. That ended up being false. So it's limited teaching. What you're saying? It's it's. It's, it's limited to what you know at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I think that traditional Christianity is false teaching. Um, although they've said they have the real gospel and everything else is false teaching, so it's kind of an interesting paradox. But um, because they do teach um, that you are separate from God, mm -hmm. um, and that's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think original sin is mean. false teaching. So the church took a bad turn at some point, and it is stuck with us, and um, definitely is with us today with Calvinist type uh, teaching that today is expressed as evangelicalism, strong evangelicalism. Uh, although a lot of evangelicals are looking for a way out of the box, as a lot of them trying to do that, especially on the issue of homosexuality. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, that the, the main evangelical organization that promoted the conversion of uh, homosexuals to heterosexuality <coughs> publicly apologized this past summer, said he was wrong, and he, um, he apologized for what they had done all those years, and they disbanded. Uh, so they, at least the moderate evangelical churches know that they were on the wrong side of that issue. What else? What are some other error as, teaching? Well, there's historical untruths that are out there. Mm -hmm. Like there's a big thing about the, like the Holocaust didn't exist, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and it did. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that the war between the states started. History is written by the victors. Like, like in that case, the South has a different idea of why the war started compared to the North. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me take it a little bit further. Where do you encounter error thinking, personally? Where have you missed, if anybody has the, the, the curse, where have you been misled spiritually? Where have you gone down a path and then come back and said, uh oh. Well, I think the biggest thing that we probably all struggle with is um, the feelings of inadequacy. You know, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, yeah. I don't think of myself as a sinner, but I do think of myself as not being good enough. Yeah. So I'm not being whole enough. And you inherited that. You inherited it not only uh, from whatever religious, formal religious training you had, but you inherited from the society you grew up in, you inherited probably from your school experience, perhaps your family experience. I mean, that's that's race consciousness. Yeah. That's there. Well, and that's all in marketing products to get you to buy it. You, yeah. You'll be a better person if you buy this thing. You know, you'll be more loved, more accepted, more popular, more beautiful, more whatever. Unworthy, but then through the crucifixion became worthy. 
where I think that's Paul's teaching and that the resurrection <coughs> can establish the salvation of the truth and that nothing was ever wrong to begin with. Yeah. So, I just, first of all, I, I want to bring up the point that uh, as much as union people don't want to admit it, there is uh, what we generally consider false teaching. And where that false teaching is, is a rat's nest to try and uh, uh, feather, you know, to bring out, to come to some sort of agreement. And we have in unity, which is a very liberal religion, a wide diversity of teachings. Um, and each, we are congregational in nature, meaning that each congregation has, and its spiritual leadership has the prerogative to allow what they wish. Um, as much as the good folks in Kansas City want to uh, frame things, they, they're only so limited in what they can do. Uh, so, but I just want to bring up, there is such a thing as false teaching. And the metaphysical uh, explanation or metaphysical standard for false teaching is simply a belief in separation from God. Okay. Whatever it is that uh, leads us down a path, and it might be the need for blood atonement, it might be a belief in uh, our unworthiness, uh, whatever it is, um, that, that is, it leads to a separation, uh, a belief in a separation from God. And that is sin. That is the original you know, sin. That, uh, and it needs to be overcome. And so if we go to the second letter of Peter, which is our first and page um, 2192 in the interpreter's book. And I want to look at chapter 2, verse 17. because he, he defines right there that th this is not written by Peter. Most people believe this was written um, in, in the 120s. Okay. And what chapter 2, verse 17 is, these are, and the word in New Revised Standard Version, waterless springs, they speak bombastic nonsense with licentious desires. They promise that, verse 19, they promise them freedom, but then they themselves are slaves of corruption, for people are slaves to whatever masters them. Okay. You there? This is chapter 2, verse 17. Second Peter. Second, Second Peter. Peter. Yeah. yeah. Not to be confused with First Peter. They're, they're, uh, entirely different era. Yes. Yeah. But just look at this. Yeah. Bombastic nonsense. Licentious desires, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For they, for people who are slaves to whatever mass, who people are slaves to whatever masters them. So that's a call again to overcoming um, that we can, we, you know, we can become trapped. Then if we go to, you kind of put your held on to this and go to the book of Jude which is just prior to Revelation huh? those are some pretty traumatic metaphors the dog turns back to its own body yes yeah the isn't, sow is washed isn't it disgusting <coughs> yeah. <laughs> because I mean the historical backdrop is it's now uh, roughly 100 years after Jesus is, is gone and people are coming in and um, they're saying that this business of holding to the faith is not important. And they're probably teaching a very loosey goosey form of spirituality that has a lot of licentiousness in it. It probably has you know, licentiousness that probably means uh, sexual or free love of some sort. Um, and this, this book is, is responding to that. And if we go to, and, and what they're saying, they're using very strong language. Um, and what they're saying is that, you know, they're, they're basically swallowing their own vomit. 
and that's the, that's the I mean, it's a pretty gross uh, metaphor, but that's what's in there, and, and it is, you know, that, that's their belief. If you go to Jude, which is one <coughs> chapter only, and verse uh, four it says, "Intruders have stolen in among you people who long ago." Uh, were designated for to be condemned as ungodly, who pervert the grace of our God into licentiousness. There's licentiousness again. Okay, so clearly, what's going on and what happens with sex, S-E-C-T-S, is uh, that the the discipline of the original group begins to erode, and that's what's happening here. And these people are resisting that that uh, erosion of discipline trying to hold the church, uh, not necessarily to celibacy, but to some sort of high standards. Okay. And, and um, so that's Jude and Second Peter. Now if we go to John, which is just back up from Jude, and you have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. This is written a little bit earlier. And who knows what the main theme is in 1st the John? Love, yeah. And metaphysically, who is the disciple of love? John. John, right, absolutely. And if we go to chapter 4, verse 7, starting there is that real well-known section. It has the, has the header there, God is love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Is that reminiscent of the Gospel of John? Have you heard, you know, do you hear the, the, the Last Supper statements? If you uh, have love for one another, you will be my disciples. And it's written in the same language. Uh, most people think it was written by someone else, but it's an example of where someone read the Gospel of John and wrote a letter of John using the same language and the same metaphors. Okay. So what is overcoming for John? How do we overcome licentiousness? How do we overcome things in race consciousness? How do we overcome feelings of inadequacy? How do we overcome uh, feelings that we are uh, we need to be atoned by uh, the blood of Jesus? Something, anything you resist persists. So the act of fighting is going to keep it alive. The whole you cannot serve two masters means that while you're interviewing petitioners, the focus on why it grows in strength. Yeah. So I guess to overcome is kind of a, it's just a, a switch in focus. Yeah, thoughts. yeah. And, but the, the method of overcoming for John is <coughs> to love. Right. And we don't hear that in Paul. You know, we, we, we kind of hear it in Paul. We kind of hear it in the Sermon on the Mount. We hear it in the Gospel of John. But the, the Gospel of John and probably the Sermon on the Mount, I, I don't know, the, the Gospel of John are probably words that are attributed to Jesus. Probably. Uh, but the point is, is Paul talking about love? I, I don't think so. We, we went through three nights of uh, Paul, and we read a lot of his stuff. And there was... John, Paul never came out and said, God is love. But now, after Paul, somewhere around after the turn of the century, it seems that the Christian sect is saying the way to hold this movement together is to be uh, a community of love. There's a shift, there's a theological shift that's going on here. And the Gospel of John comes out as a Gospel of love. And the letters of John come out as a, as a as letters of love. If we, I mean, we can go through starting with uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, and then go through that whole section. Uh, verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Abide in him and he in us. That's the that's the parable of the, the, the vine in the Gospel of John. I abide in 
in, um, in, in, I am a branch of the vine of, 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 of God, and God abides in me, and I abide in God. Without being part of that vine or that vineyard, um, I, I'm cut off. Okay. So I just, just want to kind of characterize this whole section of letters, the John letters, the John Gospel, and then we get into the John Revelation, as a shift of Christianity from theological questions about the temple and their relationship with Judaism. They're no longer concerned about circumcision. They're concerned about how to hold this movement together. And the John people, their answer is by becoming, by focusing on love. And by doing that, and, and we know they won the argument. You know how we won the. You know how we know that the John people won that argument? Because the books are in the New Testament. Absolutely, right on. Yeah, they made it, and there's a whole bunch of books that didn't make it, and we we have a lot of those books. Okay, but these ones made it, and so they won the argument. Absolutely. I have a question. So, chapter four. Verse 10 says, in, in this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Ouch. <laughs> yep, right. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that they completely abandoned this idea of, of um, a sacrifice or an atoning sacrifice. Um, the question is, who is the Christ and who is being crucified? Okay, which is a very Paul-type concept. Um, now, they're there. I mean, the, the blood atonement is there. But um, the whole focus is on love. It's not on Jesus dying for our sins. I mean, to the extent of, you know, the Gospel of John, you know, God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe that's you know, John 3.16. I mean, that's, that's clearly there. There's no doubt about that. But the focus is different. Um, God loves me. You know, God is love to the extent that I express God uh, love, lovingness. I am an expression of God. That's the focus. So and that's that how we have to read these letters. Of your mind. Hmm? That would be another a renewing of your mind. Absolutely. You know that, yes. and then that's how you work out your own yeah. salvation. So yeah. that's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to bring up, this is good, to me, spiritually, this is good stuff. Mm -hmm. This is really, you know, real good stuff. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to me. Deep stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, now the problem is we get the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Okay, which we're going to get into a little bit. Um, I have a question. Yeah. The time and the ages of these people, I mean, it's like it's saying it's 60 years after his death. Well, how old did they live to? Mm -hmm. I mean, did they live to be hundreds of years old? Or is this... Oh, no, it's clearly a second or third generation. So, the, so this John might not be the original John. Right. The, there is a tradition, which is probably a, has some truth in it, that the disciple John uh, lived longer than all the others. Mm -hmm. And he lived in, in the area that we know as Turkey, and maybe all the way up to the years 80s or 90s, um, that he lived to be an old man. And that's possible, because he's portrayed in the Gospel of John as being young. Um, and so, let's say he's 15 to 20 years old at the time of Jesus' death, then mm -hmm. put him born around the year 15, you know? And so, yeah, he could have easily lived. So he could be like that. Yeah. Possibly, but um, linguistically, no. Uh, but it, it's possible. But he certainly inspired it, and the belief is that he was in, you know, the, the revelation was on the island of Patmos, which is just outside of, you know, on the coast. Um, he might have been been leading a community there uh, that wrote in his name, and that would have been the way they did it. I mean, if if he had a community 
in the area. People that were going to write were not going to write in their own name. They were going to say, this is the gospel that we get from John. And that was customary, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, that's the way they did it. You know, they couldn't write. Yeah, possibly. It was a verbal. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why I want to, at the beginning, I said there's this period of Peter, this period of Paul, this period of John. And that's my own creation, okay? <laughs> and take it for whatever it's worth. But in my opinion, it makes sense when we read the, uh, this Acts to Revelation to break them up that way and to understand that they, they, all those letters don't necessarily say the same thing because they're, it's over a 100 year or a 75 you know, year period. And you have the destruction of Jerusalem right in the middle of that period. And you have this sect that is growing from perhaps 2,000 people by the time Paul starts off to probably 10 or 15,000 people by the time the last, by year 130. So a lot has happened. This is, you know, it's, it's like asking for consistency in American culture from 1850 to mm -hmm. 2014. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't expect that. There's too much has happened. So we have to be able to look at that, especially if we're going to interpret this spiritually. Any other comments? No. Um, is, has anyone read? I, I wish Bonnie were here. She, <laughs> she has the, she has the, the depth. The yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, but how does the Gospel of John work for you? The letters of John. Oh, uh, letters. I mean, uh, I thought you were going back to the yeah, gospel. gospel yeah. The gospel of John, it, it's my favorite of all four gospels by far. It moves me the most. It moves me emotionally more than any other gospel. I can read it over and over again, and it still makes me weep. It still sends chills up and down my spine. I actually just started reading it again uh, yesterday. I cycle through all four gospels. I just keep doing that. And I just started John. And again, when I read that, just that first paragraph, the first Chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and He was the Word, and uh, without Him there, there was not, there is nothing, because He is everything, and man, I'm kind of feeling it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John just really, really moves me and speaks to my soul. Mm -hmm. So given what we know about the historical context, context is it valid to, as a, as a unity person, to simply say, you know, I read the Gospel of John, and that it, that uh, fills me, it, it, uh, it feeds me, but um, that stuff that I find in Timothy and Titus, you know, just doesn't work for me. And is, is that a valid you know, thing to say? And I think it's, it is. Yeah, I think so. Because we, we're individual and we can, you know, believe what is true to us. Mm -hmm. And I mean, all of it is true, but what is we can hone in on. Yeah. One thing I, I liked about unity is, and what was just struck me and has always stayed with me, is what's true for you when you read this may not be true for me. That's mm -hmm. not what God is saying to me. So that doesn't mean what he's saying to you is wrong. Because it's Interpretation. All true. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially in like an Al Anon, uh, when you leave, you take what you can take with you, and then you leave the rest behind because that's the only thing that's touching you. And so, when you read some part of the Bible, something may touch you, and sometimes it won't. And then the next time you go back, you go, Oh, I get it now. And then, the, you know, every time you go back, it's going to be a different interpretation. Whatever you want spiritually. And we have to be comfortable. Um, I, that's one of the problems, I think, of, of putting the Bible on a pedestal and saying it is, quote, the word of God, and that it is an external authority that is being revealed, that, that I have to accept. Mm -hmm. the, the Bible is a, um, is a tuning fork that resonates, that, that uh, vibrates the truth that's within us. Right. And isn't that the awesomeness of, of God is that the message that is in there is so different for everybody. I mean, it's a million interpretations, millions of interpretations, which makes it 
the awesomeness of what he is. Which is the magic word in unity. Yeah. I mean, it is. Yeah. It seems to work. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to However, you know, I just want to bring up this basic concept that sin exists, and sin is a belief and a separation from God, and that erroneous teaching exists. It's there. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, I just tell people in Georgetown, we don't, aren't going to do satanic rituals, and we aren't going to run through the woods naked, barking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's something, it's just, they don't promote this idea of unity of, uh, of God. You know, they, they promote some sort of you know, perverse um, infatuation with something. Uh, so, And in this particular case, the, the people that are being called out as being false teachers are um, not the fundamentalists, but rather the, the guru of the month who's come around and teaching licentiousness. Uh, but that happens to be a historical concept. Okay, I'm a little bit, let me uh, go into the book of Revelation and I will do the prologue and then after we take our break, we'll go through the actual text. And if you have, um, does, does everyone have this tonight? Mm -hmm. If you don't, I've got some extras. Go to page, I'm, I'm going to read to you. Go to page 57. And it was page 57 in, in this. You really acted out. Yeah, well, <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I don't, I don't color and I don't dance. But it was, a, it was a Saturday night. It was about 60 years after Jesus had died. And 25 or 30 people had gotten together at a house church. And they had gotten there to see a one-act play. And the minister of this particular church had been to the regional meeting up in Kansas City somewhere and had seen the play. He says, boy, could you come and bring that to our congregation? And so the person who did <coughs> this thing said, yeah. And so they got together, so they're there. And um, because it's a, um, this, this play really is uh, uh, possibly explosive, there was no publicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and people who were the insiders were invited. And so they were meeting, and you could see the actual room there. And the minister opens by saying, welcome to tonight's performance of the Revelation of John. It's a one-act play, and when I saw this, I was just blown away, and I had to bring this person here into our church. And as the minister, I'm aware that a lot of you think that uh, we probably shouldn't uh, be doing this. We've had a lot of challenges. Because in the last 30, 40 years, Peter was executed, Paul was executed. Um, we're constantly being harangued by not only that our, our cousin Jews, who are considering us um, uh, heretics and cultists, okay, mm -hmm. but we're in a Greek society, and every time we run into a conflict with a Hellenist, with a Greek, the Greek says, you're one of those cult people, and then they go running off to the authorities, mm -hmm and they question our spiritual integrity. So we're doing this quietly, okay? And a lot of you think that we shouldn't be doing this because there's some innuendo about the emperor here. And you know, the emperor blamed us for the fire in Rome. And the emperor uh, killed Peter and killed Paul. And so the important thing is we can't forget that. You know, we just can't, uh, we have to, we can't be complacent. We are a religious community under siege. We are a religious community under pressure. Okay? Things are not easy for us right now. And we have to stay together and we have to stay focused. Now, tonight there's a lot of secrecy about this, this uh, uh, one act play. We haven't had any publicity and we ask you not to share it with others outside. And the reason is the emperor would not be pleased if the emperor were to hear what was going to be said. Um, the emperor is not the king. Jesus Christ is the king. Paul began the process of overcoming the empire 
Jesus began the process of overcoming the empire, and Paul brought us that message. The king is, is not the emperor. The king is Jesus Christ. Well, who is the king? Well, the king is a cold-hearted lizard and an unfaithful whore. He's actually worse than a lizard. In fact, he's a ten-horned, ten -horned, seven-headed lizard. That's how bad he is. And But we can't openly say that. So what we have to do is put that in our play. And there's going to be a lot of references in this play to lizards and whores and Babylon. And we know who that is, don't we? Wink, wink, wink. <laughs> and if word were to get out, there might be a lot of kickbacks. So um, please don't do that. The other thing I want you to know, down on the next to last paragraph, everyone else will think that it's all sim symbolic innuendo. I bet you 2,000 years from now, there's going to be some heisters who are going to hear this play and are going to say, they're going to try and interpret it literally, but don't do that. You know, just know that we know what this means. We know exactly what's going on here. And there's some, it's not esoteric predictions, but it's a description of the state of affairs right now. We are living in a time of, where the leadership of, our, of the empire are lizards. Okay? They will devour us. There's a lot of symbolism there. And we might make uh, some points that are really disconcerting to a lot of people. Second paragraph of page 59. And there's going to be some extreme scenes. You're going to see a lot of gory details. Um, one of which is going to be the birth of the Christ child that is immediately chased by some dragons who try to eat it. Okay, that's how gory it's going to get. But just remember that this is a one-act play. It's to be given in a two-hour time frame in a single setting. And so emotionally, while it may have a lot of negativity, at the end it has a powerful message of victory. So it's, it's the, the wrong way to understand this revelation of John is to read part of it and then interpret that part of it. The entire play has to be interpreted as one full dramatic event. We wouldn't go to see a Broadway play and just look at one song and say that is the the, the message of the play. It's the play has to be taken together and what the revelation of John is about is overcoming. The revelation of John is about a new heaven and a new earth. The revelation of John is about a new Jerusalem. The revelation of John is about the release of the lizard that's in our life that holds us in bondage. Do you see why the revelation of John might make it into the Holy Scriptures if it's seen as a one-act play, if it's seen in its entirety for what it really is, is a description of the overcoming of error consciousness and a, and a, um, a, a victory of Christ consciousness. Because Christ is King. have to hold that and, and tell ourselves when we read the Revelation of John, we're not going to stop until we get to the last chapter and we read about the victory. Okay. And so the message of the Gospel of John is to trust God. Right now it's difficult times. Um, we got the wrong man in office. Okay, it's not, it's not my president; it's somebody else's president. Okay, the society has gone the wrong way. The Jews haven't heard us, and things look tough right now. The, this one-act play is about holding uh, to truth, staying the course, knowing that victory is ours eventually, and that is why it's the last book. I have a yeah. question. So one thing that I my mind keeps shifting around and I understand it is 
we talked about the historical context and kind of the intent of you know, what was going on when these things were written and so forth. Then we talked about the metaphysical understanding. Is, is it your understanding that the metaphysical understanding was also the intention? Thank you for a beautiful entree into our exercise <laughs> after the break. <laughs> but, but it's an unintentional intention. In other words, a fundamental metaphysical concept is that the inner expresses the outer. Mm -hmm. That just as there is uh, a race consciousness that is expressed outwardly uh, as war and tribulation, there is a Christ consciousness that is expressed outwardly as well. And so historical events in good old unity teaching is the result of our thinking nature. And so the state of our inner consciousness is reflected in historical affairs. Now, that leads to the interpretation that the Holocaust is a man-made atrocity, mm -hmm. that tsunamis might, acts of nature, might be man-made. Uh, that's a stretch. That's tough. I, I, I won't defend that. I won't. But definitely the Holocaust. The destruction of Jerusalem was a man-made event. Um, the persecution of Christians and the persecution of, of uh, homosexuals today is a man-made event. Um, but they are a reflection of our inner state of consciousness. So if we don't engage in the overcoming on the inner plane mm -hmm. in ourselves with our own consciousness, and collect, and then, and obviously collectively, humanity isn't doing that. Then what will occur in the outer world is a reflection of yes. mm -hmm. beasts, etc. Error consciousness mm -hmm. running rampant. And it even gets better than that because unity uh, began as a sect and did not attempt to become a church. Mm -hmm. The entire intention of the film was, was to change consciousness, not to build an ecclesiastical structure. And to the extent that Joel Olstein on one end and Oprah Winfrey on the other end today are carrying on that message, and I think it's probably a fair statement that they are, mm -hmm. um, we have changed the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that, that's certainly a thing, a, a, a characteristic of unity that I'm most proud of. Uh, our churches are the exception of Unity Hills. <laughs> Struggle, they're not exactly, uh, you know, first class affairs, not always. But we have changed consciousness in a tremendous way, especially you know, dealing with substance abuse. And, and think it's why Al Anon and Alcoholics Anonymous are so often uh, attached to New Thought churches. Mm -hmm. um, so we are in the business of transforming consciousness rather than building ecclesiastical structures. And to the extent that we are able to do that without getting recognition just shows that we're successful at it. Mm -hmm. And when Charles Fillmore read the Bible, what he saw was the unfolding of not only the consciousness of the human race, but the unfolding of consciousness of a human being, which we'll get into in Revelation also. Um, so yeah, um, everything I've described was historical kind of, you know, this idea of the emperor being the ten-horned lizard and so forth. That's historical, but it's also internal. Mm -hmm. And it's there. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, take a, we're going to get done early today, because I'm almost out of gas. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we, we go through the revelation, then we go through our, uh, our, uh, our exercise. So let's, let's take a five, ten minute break. Okay. See you in a bit.
really good, and it doesn't have that many calories, but I don't care about calories. So I have a question. Uh -huh. You keep on mentioning Greek, but it was the Romans that were in charge back then. It was Greek culture. It was Roman rule and Greek. So the Romans basically was just called because it was, that was Rome. That's why they were called Romans, because they were from Rome. Yeah, and uh, certainly um, the, the Roman culture hadn't evolved as much as Greek culture. Greek culture had been around for oh. 400 years. Rome was, was new. And at least on the eastern end of the Mediterranean, it was Greek culture. You can't change culture that way. Oh, you know? um, obviously, uh, you know, the Romans went up to England. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was no Greek culture there. No. But uh, my point is what in order for Christianity to infiltrate uh, the, the society, it had to infiltrate, infiltrate Greek culture, not Roman culture. I deal with Roman political Roman. structures, but, but it was Greek culture. In, in, yes, and the Roman shot soldier, etc. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and so we have so much Greek uh, thought in, um, in the Christian writings. I mean, there's a ton of it there, which we we aren't even aware of because we, we just assume that what we see in those writings is all Jewish. It's not. It's, it's Jewish Greek. Um, the, the whole concept of heaven, you know, in unity, we have this this idea that there's this other dimension. Um, it was not Jewish. It was Greek. Well, it's another plane. It's another plane, another dimension. Mm -hmm. That's Greek, and it's it's the idea that behind this table, behind our lives, behind everything. Is this true nature of things, a true idea, and, uh, and Unity calls that a state of heaven when we're in tune with that, when, we're, when we are uh, focused on it. That's it. My point is that's Greek. That's not Jewish. And it's it, if you believe in past lives, then if you really into that kind of stuff in this lifetime, it all ties in. It yeah, it ties in. For, I, I think my opinion is that we are really missing a vote in unity by not embracing and uh, uh, reincarnation. I, I've gone and done a couple of Sunday talks. Oh, really? And every time I bring up reincarnation, I get Do this. Do you want to come? I have I just get on this, June 22nd. I, can't. I get this kickback, though. Uh, people are not ready to go there. However, uh, I, I, I completely believe in it. Well, we, well I don't call it reincarnation. I call it past lives, which is basically the same thing. Well, there's future lives. And future lives. David, I saw, I should dig it out on uh, David Brooks, you know, the, the commentator on PBS. I don't he's a, <laughs> I, I think he's a He did this uh, TED talk last week. And his basic point was that one beautiful way to live to see your life goal as requiring multiple incarnations to achieve. In other words, if, 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 if our focus is on what I will achieve by the end of my life, that's building a resume. If I focus on what I will achieve in three lifetimes, that's an entirely different uh, uh, spiritual mindset. That's, that's great. And, and I, I just thought it was spot on. And that's something that we would, in my opinion, just would, would do very well in the marketplace of this, this concept of think of where you want to be three life signs from now. Go there rather than where you want to be at 65. There you I realize that a lot of people would look at that and say that's the goofiest idea I ever thought of. But um, to me, it makes a lot more sense than trying to get into that. And this idea that I have one lifetime in order to achieve this uh, acceptance of Jesus Christ as my Savior, so I get into that. I think that's almost cruel. Uh, but, you know, 
teaching of would say if you're working for in uh, enlightenment, it might take you four or five lifetimes to do it. And this is not working out karma. This is not a Hindu sort of thing. It's just we don't learn that fast. My next lifetime, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> and, I'm more, and Charles Fillmore, there's a great movie. There's a great movie of Charles Fillmore. He's, he's 90 some odd years old. And says, uh, he basically says, I know I'm dying, but I'm working on my bad thoughts one at a time, and I'm making progress. You know, everybody laughed. He had this old man, he's basically saying he's cleaning up his act. It's hard for an old person to, to change. But if we have this idea that Maybe multiple lives. What's all? Yeah, what's all? That's exactly. Well, when I spoke about, I, I did service on Sunday, and I talked about I compared Jesus to myself. Like, what we know. Yes. And I talked about how I was less grateful just like he was when I got the message to go to school to become a TV. I said. I'm 63 years old. I'm too old to do this. I'm not smart enough. And and then once the first step is of course resistance, getting rid of the resistance, and then um, being one with God and then fulfilling it. These were three steps, but to for, for resurrection, and that's what I'm doing is I'm fulfilling it. And they, the God of Vision just laughed. You know, I said that because there are people there that are 80 some odd years old, and they understood what I was talking about. My mother's uh, uh, 88, and she's very frail. She had stage four cancer for over three years now, mm -hmm. wow. and just before Christmas, she quit smoking. Oh no! <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> She's in, she's in, in the Elizabeth Kubler, Kubler Ross, she's in the negotiating stage right now. And, so, and uh, it's just tough. You know, I don't know my point is people, it's never too late. No, it isn't. Um, uh, one of my ex mother in laws, she was in alcohol for the longest time after she died. She died, I found out through a stepmom who I'm very close to. She goes, oh, she, she gave up drinking. Just like about a year or so before she died, and she gave up everything. And I said, what? So was, she was a heavy, heavy drinker. She had, and she had nothing. For, for those of you who are wondering what we're talking about, we were talking about uh, living with a sense that it may take multiple lifetimes for us to get it right. Get it? Mm -hmm. okay. And the positive uh, value of doing and what we lose by uh, ruling out the possibility of having multiple lifetimes. This idea that we have one lifetime to get into heaven and to get to the stage where we're sanctified by Jesus is really unfair. Yeah. Some of us live longer. Yeah. If we have multiple lifetimes, then things even out. Hmm. You know, that was something that as a young person, I just thought, well, I mean, Jesus made it really clear that there's reincarnation. Mm -hmm. That's the way I always thought about it. Mm. So I was always puzzled, like, why would he, yeah. how could you not get that from Jesus? But obviously, a lot of people don't see it that way. Yeah. So we got uh, two missing, or three. Amazing. And you could also take the board again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want me to go try to find them? No. no you know, to mean the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you understand it symbolically, we can be born again in this physical body, or we might be born again mm -hmm. after this lifetime into another body. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that can happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of my goals on Truth and Unity is to assemble the, basically the equivalent of James Dillard Freeman's book, uh, the, the Case for Reincarnation, in, in light of, um, well, first of all, we have, today we have this uh, focus on near-death experience. Yeah. A lot of people are convinced for the first time that 
um, the body is able to sustain itself for at least hours, perhaps up to three days after death. Um, and that is a scientific thing, not a spiritual thing. Um, so you're saying up to three days? Yeah. yeah so, yeah, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, that was three days later. Yeah. I mean, we don't know if it was exactly three days. Mm -hmm. uh, was it 72 hours? Yeah. So could it be that he didn't die? Well, the, the question is what's death? Mm. You know, and uh, what's resurrection? You know, and, and my point is that, I, my, my basic point is that a belief in multiple lifetimes uh, not only makes scientific sense, um, but it also makes a lot of, it's a nice way to live spiritually. Uh, I it just, David Brooks, the NPR commentator, did a TED talk that I saw this past week. And basically he said, if we live, uh, with our goals being the end of our current lifetime, that's building a resume. If we live with our goals being multiple lifetimes, that's building a eulogy. That's building something other. And, and I thought, and he got that from the Jewish rabbi's teaching, um, which I will look up, definitely. I just thought it was a beautiful uh, understanding of what the, this, the, the power of, the, of, of having a spirituality of multiple lifetimes would, would provide. And that was Charles Pellmore. You know, he definitely uh, believed that and taught it. And Unity has uh, pulled it out of its fundamental teachings or made it optional. And I think uh, I think Unity would do well uh, to bring it back in and put it on par with you know some of the other teachings that are really almost held as doctrinal in, in Unity. So we have a few. One power, one presence, uh, spark of divinity within, um, the outpicturing of our thinking process, the, the power of prayer. All those are, don't tell me unity doesn't have any dogma. That's unity dogma. <laughs> you just don't, you don't pass go, you don't, you don't get through ministerial school without giving, you know, affirmation to those, those teachings. So we, we do have our teachings, absolutely. Well, let's, um, what I want to do is, is just blow through Revelation. And I'm going to ask your help to do that. Um, top of page 60. First paragraph, the bulk of the drama is in seven episodes. Okay, And it begins with seven letters to seven churches. And if you open your, your Bibles to Revelation, in chapter one is a prologue. It's basically John is on the island of Patmos and Jesus comes to him and he has a, a revelation. So this is the revelation to John. Then we go to chapter two and from chapter two, Chapter 2 and 3 are seven letters to seven churches in Turkey, Asia Minor. And every one of those is a, uh, a, a criticism of those, of those particular cities. And each one is a, also a criticism of consciousness. Um, the message to Ephesus uh, is saying that Ephesus is overcome with desire. Um, verse 8, the message to Smyrna is that they over overcome with a desire for riches and abundance. Um, verse 12, the message to Pergamum is that they are intellectual elites and they're all in doing a head trip. Um, verse 18, the message to, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Thetira, is that they are so overcome with zeal that they're just out of control, and so forth. We can go on. Um, chapter 3, verse 1, message to Sardis, that they're into power and uh, politics. Verse 7, message to Philadelphia, is that they are 
Uh, but actually, that is the one city that is not condemned. And they are actually uh, um, praised for being a city of love. Huh. And then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those are so it opens with cities, and remember, cities metaphysically are states of consciousness. Okay, so you begin to, begin to see that right from the beginning, this is a book about consciousness. Okay, chapter four is episode two. John is taken up, then taken up into heaven, and he's shown a throne, and there there is um, seven scrolls that are open. And those, uh, chapter 4 goes through chapter 8. That's the second episode. Now what you have is this idea of a guy going through some like hallucinations. And I say that you know, not in a joking way, but he's, he's clearly got a rich imagination. Now what do we do with this stuff? Well, let me go on. Episode, let me go into the gory details and then ask what we're going to do with it. Um, verse chapter 8, verse 1, uh, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Now let me tell you why Unity is, has revised some of its texts. Charles actually wrote that since there was silence in heaven for about half an hour, there were no women in heaven. <laughs> and, uh, and Unity has cleaned that up. Okay, so, uh, so go on to uh, uh, chapter 12, episode 4, The Woman and the Dragon. And we just passed over uh, uh, we just passed over the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, so in the you have the dragon there and uh, verse for the dragons there and his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and drew them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child that's Mary about to bear Jesus so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born and she gave birth to a son a male child who is to rule all nations the rod of iron but the child was snatched away and taken to God to his throne, and the woman fled into the wilderness. So the, the dragon didn't uh, didn't devour Jesus. And then Michael comes and he defeats the dragon. What do we do with this? And what do we do with it? Interpret. We interpret. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> and we go deep into our subconscious mind to interpret it. And we play with it. And we realize that there is not truth in here, but there is truth in here that will be activated or must contend with the truth that's here. Okay, And, and so what we do is we, we recognize where truth is and we read this and we allow it to open our subconscious mind, uh, if nothing else, to find the shadow that's there and to allow that stuff to come out. There is a dragon and that wants to devour our Christ child as a little, as you know, Linda's got a whole bunch of them who come in every Sunday and she's trying to convince them that they're good, right? And society's trying to eat them up, right? So, yeah, I'm looking at you, not all of That's my point, is that message is there. There's a lot of gory stuff here. But we read this clearly to allow um, the truth in us to emerge. To be revealed. Yeah. To be a witness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I could go on and on. I mean, it's a bunch of details. What I'd like you to see also is um, if you go to, to, I want you to see two resources on truth and unity, and I am, uh, I, I'm peddling here. But first of all, in, on Truth Unity, I have um, Unity's Bible teachings for over 70 years. Um, I mean, and these were uh, lessons that were in Unity Magazine and Unity 
a weekly unity for over 70 years. And what you see over here in the uh, right column are the, uh, the, the passages. Those are the people who transcribe them. Mm -hmm. And if we go to Revelation 7, you're going to see You're going to see that we have the verse, and this is Revelation 7, 9 through 17, and then we have the particular lesson. This lesson was given on March 21st, 1920, as the interpretation. And so almost all of Revelation is, most of it, the books are there. The other thing that I want you to see, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it real quick, it's in here somewhere. I looked it up. Huh. Um, is Frank? Well, let me. It is important. Let me. Let me find it. Just a second. Resources. Uh, audio. Go to Frank Judici. Where is he? Frank Judici was a. Uh, teacher at the Unity School for many years. And he did an audio series called The Book of Revelation Revealed. And my speakers aren't working on this computer. so. Um, but what you have here are is his, um, in 58 segments, his, uh, I believe it's a four-day class on the Book of Revelation. It's excellent. It's very good. Um, so if you want to get into the details of Revelation, there's a guy, he taught at Unity, this was his class that he taught at Unity on the book of Revelation. Um, and it, you can see it's broken down by chapters, you can go to the different stuff. So those are two resources you can go to. And um, what we're about to do for an exercise, first of all, let me go to the end of Revelation, because I said in the opening statement that we should never start Revelation without going to the end of Revelation. And if we go to chapter 21, we have episode 7. Remember, there's seven episodes in Revelation. And se episode 7 is the overcoming. Episode 7 is the victory. And 21, chapter 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem. Verse 9 begins the vision of the new Jerusalem. And notice on verse 22, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So that's a reference to the temple in Jerusalem is gone, there is a new temple, it's an internal temple, um, and it, it's a, uh, a throwback to Jeremiah 31. I will write their, uh, my message on their hearts. Okay, that's verse 22. And then chapter 22, we have the, the section of the river of life, which is used in so many memorial services. It's this idea that, yes, life has been a struggle, but at the end there is a river of life. And if you remember the very first um, thing that we said in Second Peter, and I don't have it in front of me, his, the condemnation in Second Peter about the teachers was, they are this... 2 Peter 2.17, they are waterless springs. Okay? Waterless springs. But here we have the river of life. And in unity, truth and water, water is truth. Water flows. We have our baptism. What is going on is truth is flowing through us. Okay, so metaphysically, whenever you see a um, spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's in the Gospel of John. You know, talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. Right? Um, whoever drinks of this water in this well will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall uh, have in him a well of water welling up to eternal life. And what we have here is a river of life. 
So there's this metaphor of, 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 a, of water flowing that has truth and life in it. Okay. Now having said that, if you go to, I'm going to back up a little bit, and go to page 55. Does everyone have a piece of paper? No. Everybody got a pencil? Thank you. Okay. Anyone need paper or pencil? Thank you. Right. And you know what? I have misplaced the. Where is the roster? Uh, I'm incapable of oh, holding that, it. That you're just supposed for, to take it under us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even keep on to it for the rest of the class. That's okay. Uh, All right. Oh, and also, everyone has evaluations. Does everybody have an evaluation form? Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't leave do without giving it to Annalise or to, to Linda. And if you would, put it in this envelope. And oh, okay. Yeah, evaluations are real important. I won't see them, so. Um, but you'll um, hear about them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're important, but, you know, um, valuations are part of life. Yeah, it's, it's you call them surveys. They're surveys. They're not a, surveys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. But we, we do need the evaluation. I need two things from you. We need the evaluation and the paper we're about to write. Okay. okay. Don't leave without those two things being turned in. Real important. Okay, page 55. There is a, um, a method of interpreting the Bible that is close to metaphysical interpretation, but it is not real metaphysical interpretation. It's called mayutic interpretation. And mayutic, I didn't know this. I found this out today. It comes from the same Greek word, word as obstetrics. <laughs> <laughs> really? And literally. And not only that, but the reason it's used is you deliver a divine idea. Wow. It's something that Imagine. we birth. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's all yeah. becoming clear. Well, it makes me <laughs> feel proud to be, you know, um, the guy who can birth something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's exactly what we do in Mayutic interpretation, is we birth truth. And it doesn't begin with what I have there on line number one. What does the story evoke within me? That was a mistake I would take back. It begins with what is exactly going on in the story. It, it's, it's a willingness to focus on the story enough until its truth emerges. I, I actually referenced that. If you go to page, the preface, uh, page uh, V or 5, it says Introduction and Acknowledgements. Um, this is before page 1. And I say there's three things that are necessary in order to do metaphysical Bible interpretation. And the third bullet point is we have to have a commitment to read intently and deeply. We cannot read the Bible superficially. Okay? And so we have to have a commitment to explore Acts to Revelation with enough focus so that a comprehensive picture is expressed in consciousness. We can't read these passages lightly. So we may have to spend 10 minutes looking at two verses and holding them in stillness until the baby is born. The baby is, you women know, is going to be born when the baby wants to be born, not on her own agenda, not on her own schedule. So we have to commit to stay with that process until the, 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 the truth emerges. 
That's meiotic interpretation. Right. So the first thing we do is we look at the passage. And what I'd like to do, um, simply because it was Charles Fillmore's favorite Bible verse, if you would go to Colossians chapter 1. And if you, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I've got a bit, we, we could pick something really graphic in Revelation, a, an image. Um, new Jerusalem, new earth. You know, we could do that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, page 2110. This might be a bit more difficult, but if we go to uh, Colossians chapter 1, page 2110, verse 26 and 27. Uh, no, excuse me, verse 25 through 27. And I'm going to read it. I became its servant according to God's commission. And God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to the saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> we can't dim the lights without going in total darkness. Those, those are lamps right there. Let's just see what it looks like. If anybody freaks out, tell me about <laughs> That works for you. Are you comfortable with me? Yeah, sure. Last time I taught this class, this is a true story, I put on a uh, iTunes, um, what do you call it, uh, screensaver. And I thought everybody was going to get mellow and people started to get really uh, freaked out. <laughs> I saw, saw these weird shapes coming out of iTunes and music. And, <laughs> and, uh, and after about a minute of it, I realized they're going to be psychotic by the time I'm talking about it. <laughs> so I'm always cautious about turning out lights. <laughs> Who will read for us verses 25 through 27 again? Who will read for us? Just jump in. Yeah. Okay. 25 through 27. And yeah, and read from the New Revised Standard Version. You have. To, I want to, as much as possible, stay with the same version. I know you had King James. But that's fine. Most of us are in this. Get in the reading down this part. Oh, it's in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 That's fine. Yep. Okay. I became a servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to its saints, to the saints. Then God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ to you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Holding consciousness, Paul becoming a servant. Holding consciousness, the, the mystery that God made known through Jesus, through Paul, through Peter, and through John.
holding consciousness the riches of the glory of the mystery. Holding Christ in consciousness, the Christ that is in each and every person. And holding consciousness, the hope that each person has of glory. write one paragraph that describes your understanding of what these people who lived 2,000 years ago experienced. What is it that was the transformation that they claimed was the Holy Spirit? What is it that Paul saw when he was converted? What is it that turned Peter from being a coward into the leader of the Jesus movement? What is the new heaven and the new earth that the John community envisioned 2,000 years ago? Go back, go back, go historical. Give one paragraph, four or five sentences perhaps, what you sense happened and is expressed in this statement about being a servant, having God's commission, the word of God, the mystery that was hidden throughout the ages and now is revealed to saints, to those who God chose, who made known to the Gentiles the riches mystery which is Christ in each and every person. One, one paragraph.
start again in about one minute. We'll continue in about a minute. We continue again. There's more to this? <laughs> yeah, remember you said you were going to finish early. <laughs> Two minutes early. <clears throat> okay. So, we begin birthing divine ideas, meiotic interpretation, metaphysical interpretation, by looking at the text and asking what happened spiritually then. Regardless of whether it's true or not, what happened spiritually then. Now the question is what's happening spiritually now in our world? If Christ in you, the hope of glory was then, it is now. It is, it is now. People today want glory. Today we can become servants. People do become servants. There are many beautiful servants in today's world that have been commissioned by God It was that have been commissioned by God to make the the word of God fully known. That speak of the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages, and that reveal that mystery. Today there are people. Where is this happening today? It could be Nelson Mandela. It could be Mother Teresa. But it could be your grandmother. Hmm? It could be us. Absolutely. It could be in the teachers who Linda keeps busy on Sunday morning. Where do we see this today? What you, whatever you've written in the first paragraph, I want you to write a second paragraph saying, in today's world, this is where these divine ideas are unfolding. This is where these divine ideas are operative. This is where Christ in each person is expressing glory. Describe how God is working in today's world as God worked 2,000 years ago in Paul's world.
We'll start again in one minute. The third and final step in this exercise, we know we have a sense of what happened 2,000 years ago. We have a sense of what happened 2,000 years ago is continuing to express today. And we need to know what our response is. We need to know, first of all, how it is working in us. How do we sense ourselves as being servants according to God's commission? How do we sense ourselves as making the word of God fully known? How do we have a sense of carrying on the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages? How do we sense ourselves as being chosen by God? And to do what? And how do we sense that we have Christ in us and that that Christ's presence in us is our only true hope of glory? One paragraph or more, if you wish.
managed to bring this to a conclusion. <laughs> I think that was a very fortuitous. It's me, I didn't even know it was me. That's fine. That's, we needed we needed groundwork, and we got it. That's that's. <laughs> Let's just give thanks for these, this cloud of witnesses that lived 2,000 years ago. And as misinterpreted as they might be, or as unappreciated as they might be, starting with Jesus, these people called us to a higher level of awareness of our divine nature. They did the best they could. And they left us a rich legacy. They taught us that we are children of God, that we are loved by God. They taught us that there is one power and one presence. They taught us that it is possible for us to overcome all things in life that we could be pioneers and perfectors of our faith, just as Jesus was also. They taught us that the tyranny of the emperor, that which we believe to be insurmountable, is overcomable. They taught us that God is king, This is a beautiful crowd of witnesses, cloud of witnesses. And when we open the books from Acts to Revelation, we can be grateful that some of their message has gotten through and been passed on historically to us. And that the divine ideas that the the Spirit of God which passed through them the night Jesus was offered up, 50 days later in the Pentecost, and then throughout the first century of Christianity, we can be grateful that God spoke in those times and continues to speak. Our hearts are open. May we become truth students of the Bible. Not Bible students, but truth students. May truth flow and flow and flow in our consciousness, purifying it of all that is false and allowing its brilliance, its beauty, its love to overcome us. So be it. Amen. 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 Okay, two pieces of paper. <laughs> Don't get out of here. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, I will tackle you down the hallway. <laughs> and I, I retyped mine because it lines on the back of my notes, so I don't want to give it up. Okay, or just can run down it? it. You can, you can, that's fine, but okay. it, it's on you. Get it back to me. I don't want anybody leaving here <laughs> burdened with another assignment that they have to do. I'd much rather you, uh, you you're welcome to email it to me if you want to type it in.